this time we'll receive our tithes. Steve, would you read the background of when the roll was called up yonder? When the roll was called up yonder was written by James M. Black, who lived between 1936 and 1938, when a poor young girl didn't answer the roll call of a young people society because she had died of pneumonia. Remarking on her ab absence, Mr. Black spoke of the sadness of anyone being absent when the names were called of those written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Revelation, the book of Revelation refers to the Lamb's Book of Life in chapter 3, 5, which says, He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the Book of Life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. Heavenly Father, we just give you praise and thanksgiving that the names are rolled up yonder and will be there. We give you praise, Lord, for giving that to us, the wonderful blessing of Christ and salvation, and the hope that we have that we're assured of that. I praise you, God, too, for the many blessings you give us every day. Lord, accept these offerings that these folks faithfully give in honor and gratitude for all that you provided for us, homes, family, cars, Opportunities, Lord, to grow. God, you're so awesome. We love you. Thank you. And through Christ, we boldly say that. Amen. Amen. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the song gets me going. I get kind of excited about, hey, maybe he'll blow the horn today. We'll be out of here. God is good. Let's come to him in prayer. Father God, we just give you praise and glory and honor that you're such an awesome God. And you have so many blessings for us. Uh, Lord, studying Ephesians has just been such a blessing to us. The privileges, the opportunities, the people that we're to become for your glory and for your honor. And you have the best for us. What an exciting thing, Lord, to be able to be here today and to share in worship and to sit down and break bread together and also enjoy looking to the future and what you've got in store for us. I want to pray, Father God, for our great nation. I just pray, Father God, you continue to bless us Give our leaders wisdom and insights to know what to do, and especially some of these hot spots that we know of, like Hamas and Gaza, like situations like the Ukraine, and many other spots that we're not even aware of. I pray that you'll be with the men and women who protect us, that you'll be with them as they go undercover and they find out the plots and the difficult things. We have even seen our future uh, possible, our, 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 an ex-president shot again, and then another one trying to take him out. Lord, bless these candidates with safety. Protect them, Lord. And I just pray, Father God, for this election, that you will rule and that you will be honored in it. 
and many great things will take place through it. I want to pray for our shut-ins, those faithful ones who want to be here but can't because of health limitations. We think of Lucille and we think of Joyce. We think of Karen. And Lord, we just want to pray also too for those that are grieving. And we think of the Jackson family and the Titus family. I think of my cousin. I think of two officers that I know have had miscarriages. Just be with them and bring them comfort. And Father, we pray for our sick too. I want to pray especially for Lisi, who used to be a secretary here for the school and is a young woman who's got pancreatic cancer. I pray for Jim and Linda, and both of them have had surgeries. I pray for our brother James, who spent a little stent in the hospital. I just pray they can figure out what's going on and bring healing to his body. I pray for Mike. I pray also too, Father God, for Everett and Sharon and their battles, Lord, and for Samantha Mama and Jason Stevens and Jordan Rickles, who are all battling cancer. We give you praise that Steve's mom's out of the hospital and she's doing much better. Pray for Brad and Sega and for their life situations. We pray for Mr. Mack and Tim who may have to get surgery and get a new kidney. Pray for Floyd and Reva and Rusty and Katrina, both all four of those battling cancer. For Bill Rogers, who's gonna be getting a stent tomorrow morning. Just pray that you'll be with the doctors and guide their hands. I pray for Chaplain Hernandez, who had quadruple bypass and is just about ready to get back into service. Pray for Alfonso, who had uh, quadruple bypass and then his kidney got damaged. And now they're gonna work on doing a repair on that. I pray for Lauren Pippin, who also is a chaplain at Parkinson's and then also uh, his dementia. Be with his wife as she ministers to him. Pray for those who battle in addictions, Lord. You know who they are. And you know what the monkey on their back that they've created for themselves. But I thank you, God, you're a gracious God. And you can heal them and that you can give them strength to battle and say no. Pray for Jordan and Ryan and David and Eric and Ricky and Russell. And for the people around them who are being affected in their families by their addictions. And Father God, now we come to you and ask you to help us to hear your word and understand it. And that we can all come away from here making application to our own lives and what we need to do and to live more glorifying to your name. Lord, we lift up those that maybe couldn't put a piece of paper into the bullet, into our basket today, but there's people out there that may need our prayers. Lord, we lift them up by name. You hear those right now. Now, Father God, open up your word. Help us to hear Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Napoleon Bonaparte was known as a great conqueror. But what a lot of people don't understand about him, he also loved art. And he loved to collect art. And one of the things that he conquered was Egypt back in 1801. But he was only there for a few short years because his ministry began to fail as a conquering leader. He had a military failure there in Egypt. But one thing that came out of it was something called the Rosetta Stone. Now, I know you've heard that word before. If you watch TV, they're always on TV. Get the Rosetta Stone, how to translate it or how to speak a different language. Well, the Rosetta Stone was discovered by Alexander the Great's people. And because of that discovery, we got to know about the Egyptian hieroglyphics and also Egyptian studies. And we know a lot about that culture because of that stone. Well, today, the Apostle Paul is giving us a Rosetta Stone. Paul is giving us a sacred secret. He's letting it out that's been closed for centuries. Since the beginning of time. And God has let out a little bit about it, but today, Paul in Ephesians is letting the word out. And Paul is the one who's opening the door of that secret. 
The sad part about it is, as Paul says, he's a steward of the secret, and so is the church. The tragedy is the church has missed its time at times of sharing the mystery and disclosing what should be going on in people's lives. That's why the reason is the churches in our world today, many of them are weak. Many of them are inflicted and ineffective because they're dealing with mankind and serving mankind rather than serving God's word up and giving it as it should. As Paul says, good stewards of the mystery and rightly dividing the word of truth. And this morning, Paul is going to lay out to us some of the mysteries to him that are marvelous. A lot of us have known them because we've studied the word and some of you don't. But the great truth here is that God's church is not a divine afterthought. God had a plan for the church before the beginning of time. And that all the saved will be part of that body, a special group of people. And that it's just not Jew and Greek anymore, according to Paul here. In fact, the Holy Spirit is going to share with us what God's actual plan has been before the foundation of the world. Now, if you remember in chapter 1, Paul opened the curtain to us and showed us what God did to save us. How his predestined and electing plan, how we who cannot even say we want God, touched our hearts and gave us the ability to be elected and called of God. And you here today who are saved are part of that special group that he called. And that you accepted his grace, which is a gift from God. And also the faith that you had is also a gift from God. From beginning and end, your salvation is totally a gift of his grace. Beginning and end. But then, he also wants to show us, not only how he wants to reconcile creation and people, but that also he wants to unite people as one. In this third chapter, the second chapter, he says, you know, this is all I did for you in chapter one to save you. And that you accept it by faith through grace. And the reason I give you grace to accept it and have faith in it so that you can't go around and say, look at I figured out God's salvation plan and man, I'm going to heaven. <laughs> That's not it. What God did, he said, you accepted it by grace, not of your own thinking or doing or will, but it's truly a gift from God. And at that point, we should be overwhelmed. But it doesn't stop there. If you remember last week, we talked about how now we are being created and given this salvation so that we can be his workmanship. He's got things planned for you to do as a believer in Christ. You are his workmanship. He's going to work you and he's going to mold you. But he's also got things for you to do. That he's planned before the foundation of the world, it says. And how we're going to do that is through this wonderful group and society called his church, the body of Christ. And his mystery is mystery that he unveils. The who done it is God. And what he did and what he's going to do through us and through you is incredible. And one of the mysteries that Paul has <laughs> Is himself. Because Paul can't fathom why God would call him a hater of the church, a persecutor of the church, a man who would get documents to get people ripped out of their houses and put false claims on them so that they could get killed. 
A man who stood by Stephen and made sure that he was stoned to death. And made sure that their clothing of the people that were throwing it were taken care of. And Paul says it. Look what he says. He says in verse 8, To me, the very least of all the saints, he is blown away that God would choose him to bring the mystery and to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. He hated the Jews. I mean, he hated the, the, the Gentiles. He was such a strong Jew. He could not stand Christians. And yet the mystery of it all is that God chose him. Number one, to be saved from his hatred heart. To a loving heart, preaching to the very people that he hated. And he's, he just says, this is a mystery of God's grace. But if you notice how humble he realizes, the least of the saints. He deserved to do that, and yet God chose him. And you see, then he unravels the mystery of God's will. Not only for him personally. But now we're going to see God's plan. And he says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of the Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there has been made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can't understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. Paul is blown away that God would choose him. He's humbled by it. Because I don't know if you've ever had it. You see, I grew up in New Jersey and New York. I grew up in a high school that was 75% Jewish. And let me tell you, the Hasidic Jews, these people who are very conservative Jews, they hate you. They cannot stand you. They're disgusted by you. They say the word goyim, and it means you're dirt to them. This was Paul's attitude to the Gentiles. I've seen it before. Horrible. I see them beat people. They're brutal. A lot of them are diamond dealers. And the only thing anybody believes they understand is the language of money. But guess what? Paul, God in his mysterious plan called him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And to do goodwill to them. And bring them to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And in God's plan. In God's mysterious plan, he takes And in God's eternal plan, this is what he decided. And it wasn't from Paul, it was from God. And what we find here, Paul is saying, it's not enough now to give them Christ, but then to bring them into a local assembly together, both Jews and Gentiles together as one family. Can you imagine? We remember what, how hard it was with segregation and the blacks and the whites coming together back in the 60s. How ugly that was. Can you imagine how ugly this was for Paul? And from the Jews, they continued to wrestle with this for a long time. In fact, you read it in the New Testament several times. Even the leaders, like Peter, struggled with that. But it brought glory to God. You see, and, and Paul, look what he says. He says, I'm a prisoner. This is another mystery to him. Why would God make him a prisoner to share the gospel to out to the world? And here he's stuck in a prison. And that also Paul is locked in himself. 
And it's a mystery how God is using suffering for God's glory. But we know, friends, as Christians, we know when things are difficult. God's got a purpose in it for each one of us. Now, you may not believe that, but that's God's truth. He's doing it through Paul right now. He gets beaten. He goes to jail. He's mistreated. But we know God is working through him. Max Lucado wrote a beautiful book called On the Anvil. And man, if you have suffered for Christ, if you have been persecuted, or if you've been going through trials in your life, you need to read that book. But basically, it's the New Testament. And he says, some people are tools that are bent and broken and are put on the shelf. And that they're not suffering, but they're just laying there. And then there are those who are sharpened and honed, ready for use in God's world. And have faced the fires of tribulation and know what it's like and fight it. But are being used by God. And then there are others who right now are being honed by God's suffering to come into their life, like Paul. And that he is white hotting that metal inside of you to clean off all those impurities, to make you sharp, to grow you deeper in faith, so that you can trust him when the going gets really bad and go south. Paul talked about his thorn in the flesh. He was sick. He was hurting. And yet he continued to do what God called him and knew that God sent him this thorn in the flesh by Satan himself. Because God needs to keep him humble because Paul was an arrogant person. But God took care of that pretty quickly. He gave him some hardships so that he could be honed in for God. Some of you may be going through difficulties in your life right now. Maybe in a job or with a marriage or health or family or children. But God is using you. He's honing you. And the Lord will help you through that. But you need to entrust him. Look at what Paul says. He says, but God's grace is sufficient. So I am going to glorify him in my weakness. If you pull yourself out of those situations, you can glory in yourself. And God doesn't want that. He wants you to know that there's nothing else you have but him. And when you come through that, you're not going to go around, well, <laughs> I just was tough. <laughs> no. If it wasn't for the Lord, I wouldn't have made it through that. I know this myself. Sometimes the devil's mighty working on those who, you see, he doesn't have to go down to side pockets. He's got them. Where does he come? 10 o'clock, Harvest Community Church. He's working on you, working on me. He doesn't want us to be honestly working for the Lord. And he wants to bring, have any of you ever, and I better not, don't raise your hand. How many of you ever had a fight on the way to church in the morning? Don't raise your hand. Guess who's in the car with you, tapping you on the shoulder? That's why Sandy and I don't, I come here early. That's why we don't go in the car together. Remember that pair of pants Dave left in the middle of the living room? Whew. Folks, this is the mystery that Paul's talking about. I remember my first years of ministry. You know, you spend seven years in school studying. You go to seminary and you can't wait to become a pastor. 
I even thought about not going to seminary and going right into the ministry. And the Lord spoke to me through a professor and he told me, no, you need it. And he was right. And I'll never forget the first week of ministry. I wish I could have gone back to seminary for another three years. But I was scared to death. And I was panicked. And I'll never forget the struggles we had with that first. Here we thought it was going to be a glorious thing. All the saints were going to want to do that. We're going to love the Lord and we're going to grow the church. And then we found out the real church. Sandy and I prayed for four and a half years to be removed from that church. And that God would take us and put us in another church. And every time something came along, he slammed the door shut. And we were disappointed. And I felt so low about my ministry. I had people coming up to me and saying all kinds of crazy. Why are you preaching that born again stuff? Or, 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 or why are you telling us to trust Christ? I believe in God. That's all I need. These were board members. I remember one night it got so bad. And I'm sitting there and laying, I'm in, the, I'm in the, uh, the next morning, I'm in a park praying to God. And then <laughs> this church comes out of the blue and says, we're very interested in having you come out and talk with us, our committee, big church. <laughs> I go there and the committee is in love with me. They're ready to hire me on the spot. <laughs> but God... You know, he, that wasn't God's will. He said, no, Dave, you got another 10 years at, 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 at Fort Lee, New Jersey. You got a lot of work to do. I thought that was the sunshine. And after the committee meeting, I flew out to Michigan. And after that committee was done, I was staying at the retiring pastor's house. <laughs> And I come in the door and all of a sudden I sit down and the pastor's getting me a drink and I hear him with his wife. And all of a sudden she's crying. What's going on here? And he comes out and says, well, oh Dave, I want to share with you why my wife is crying. You see, my son-in-law is also in wanting this job. They were so hopeful that he would get the job. And when you went and interviewed, they really loved you and want to offer you a call. And I'm going, oh, brother. And she is so sad that they like you better than him. And they want you. Well, of course, I was not going to take that. But, and again, it was a disappointment. But you see, God works his mysterious plan. Because see, God knows what we needed. Sandy and I became very close in those years. Sandy and I grew in our faith those years. And let me tell you, they were not easy years. But God was working. It's kind of like reminds me of the story of a mother who was having a problem with her son coming to church on Sunday morning. And she said, son, you're going to church. I said, I'm not going to church. I don't want to go. You have to go. I don't have to go. They don't like me and I don't like them. But son, you're the pastor. <laughs> That's the way it felt. Seriously. Have you ever had one of those jobs that you just don't even want to get up in the morning to go to? You see, God was working a plan. And even though we were really going through some difficult times, it brought us together. And also, it began to bear fruit of young people. I had one guy get up in the middle of one of my sermons who was a, a, a financial guy in, on Wall Street and got up in rage at what I was saying in my sermon and said, I'm not listening to this crap anymore and walked out. Oh, but God had to stay there and grew us and built us. 
It's interesting what God does through that. Some of the young people that came to know Christ and that took over the leadership of that church. And today our parents and grandparents and have stayed there and minister. One of the things that blew me away the other, <laughs> about this past summer, I think I found out. But one of the guys who I was privileged to lead to Christ, him and another guy, two young guys were interested because I played football, but when we got to go and I took them out in the streets and we were sharing the gospel, they came to know Christ. And the interesting thing about it, my nieces and grand nieces and nephews go to a Christian school in Northeast New Jersey. And what I found out is that man's, that young man's son is the principal at that Christian school because he came to Christ. He led his son to Christ. And his son now is the principal at a Christian school, helping children grow in Christ. You just have to be around long enough to see what God's doing. You know, you're going to go to heaven someday and you're going to sit there and go and people are going to say, I remember you. Do you remember what you did this? And you're going to sit there and go, I really don't remember that. But you were used by God to touch my life. That's what you're going to hear. And you see here, Paul speaks about this mysterious plan with the Gentiles. He says, which in other generations made known the sons of men as has now been revealed by the holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. To be specific that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body of Christ, fellow partakers to the promise of Christ through the gospel. Paul is saying that this is wonderful stewardship that God has put me in. That I'm sharing to the Gentiles. And this is something God has wanted and is wanting and will take place. When Jews and Gentiles alike will be together in one community under Jesus Christ as the church. And that's going to be a new society. And we sometimes have a problem with that, don't we? The church. We as evangelicals don't have a really a healthy view of the church. Yes, the church has gone all different ways throughout history. Protestant churches especially. Some of them have grabbed on to liberalism. And the evangelical church lacks a high view of the church. Because it has not done what it's supposed to. Now in America, we are individuals, and because of that, we like to be pulled up by the bootstraps myself. But the church has not done its job in bringing the gospel to the world, as it should. God raised up Campus Crusade, inner varsity for young students. Billy Graham developed a huge organization of saving souls, but it's not the church. It's helped individuals come to know about Christ. And the Billy Graham Association learned that. That what they were doing was good. But it wasn't going far enough. And they realized they needed to make a change in their organization. Because when Billy Graham would get up there and give the altar call, hundreds of people would come. But guess what? They'd go home and guess what? Nothing. Nothing. I don't know if you've ever worked for Billy Graham Crusade. I've worked for four of them. And one of the great things they developed is a, taking churches way before, a year before they do a crusade. And training people on how to share the gospel. How to help people grow in the gospel. And make sure the people that come to Christ, that walk those aisles... Have a church to go to so they can grow. Because what they were finding is they were having these little baby Christians being born. But nobody taking care of them. Can you imagine having a baby delivered at the hospital and nobody taking care of them? No feeding him. No giving him nutrition. 
What happens to that baby? It dies. And this was what was happening with the Billy Graham crusade. And they had to learn that. And they used that. And you see, that's why the church has an anemic viewpoint of itself. And why we're not making those inroads. One, because the preaching was not doing what it's supposed to. And number two, people were not bringing into the church. You know, we have a lot of people who say, I don't need the church. I'm the Lone Ranger Christian. How does that work for you? We need each other. We need the church. And when the Apostles' Creed, some people have a meltdown when we do the Apostles' Creed. And we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. They're thinking, Catholic? We're not Catholic, we're Protestant. No, 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 no. It means there that everyone who's a believer in the work in Jesus Christ, Catholic means universal. All those who believe in Jesus Christ are part of the church. And that we need to learn and feed from each other. And that we work together. So that we can grow ourselves and be prepared as we go out into the world as God's missionaries and not be neglected. And it's a mystery that God has brought together now the church. It's so important that the church is a big part of our lives. And the church, I don't mean this building, I mean you, each other, being together. Nourishing each other, encouraging each other, lifting each other up. Because there are hardships out there. People don't like Christians. I mean, out here, we're st it's amazing to me how nice people still are about it. Even though they may not believe. In the East Coast, they'll tell you right on face value, you can take Jesus and go stuff yourself. That's the way they are. That's the way the world is. And yet the Bible here says we're fellow partakers, and this is God's revelation. And the way to do it is through the church, Jesus Christ's bride, who loves us and brought us together in this one big family so that we can stand for the gospel and that the work is effectual, it's effective as the Holy Spirit works in people's lives and we encourage them. And that as Paul is trying to get the, the Jews to understand and the Gentiles, that we're fellow heirs. There's no more Jew or Gentile. He says it in Galatians. He says there's no Jew or Gentile, slave or free, man or woman. But we're all one in Jesus Christ. And that we are willing to die for that. And that the preaching of the gospel is critical. And the truth of the gospel. We see that. We as Kansans had a living example of this. I was blown away when I did a funeral for one of my ex-chaplains. And one of the speakers at that service was Gracia Burnham. And how she shared about my colleague and how he helped her. In a time when it was very low for her, Martin had died and her children were back in Derby and coming back and trying to put everything together. And how Martin was willing to put his life on the line, her and Martin. And for 376 days were held by the Contras and not afraid to die for the truth that they know. And even his captors were won by his love. It was said by her that they didn't even want to put chains on their feet at night while they were sleeping. Because how kind Martin and Gracia were to them. How he even fixed the captor's satellite phone. And then would speak to them at night about Christ. These Muslims. And one day she said, Martin, this is so difficult. He said, but honey, the Lord says to us to serve the Lord with gladness. And that's what we do, honey. 
It gave her the strength. Dipping into the scriptures and how he patiently would speak to them every night about his Lord. And how they were falling in love with him. And her. Because of their love for Christ. And you see, this is what Peter learned. When Jesus dropped that blanket and said, kill and eat, Peter. Oh, Lord, I can't. That, that's unclean. No, 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 no. What I call unclean is unclean. What I call is clean. You eat it. And he did. And you see, this is critical. Because there are people out there who do not like the faith. Some of you probably have them in your family. I had a guy the other day. Why are you talking to that lady about that crap that you talk about? Right at the mall. I'm trying to share with this woman about Jesus and love for her. And she was lonely and she's struggling. He got into my face. So this is wrong. I should call security. See? But it's the mystery, folks. And people are not going to like it. But by faith in the church of Jesus Christ, we tell them the joy. And the conveyance of that mystery is just the preaching. Of which I am administered according to the gift of God. Grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of the saints, the grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light the administration of the mystery, which for ages had been hidden in God and created all things. You see, it's amazing that God would use preaching that monologue. To tell people about the truth. To share that truth. And here he is saying, one of the least of the saints, he's chosen me to lay out this God's plan. And notice how humility he does it so. But he also wants us to know. To make all men together in one beautiful thing called the church. John Stott wrote in Ephesians, he says, focuses on what God did through the historical work of Christ and does through his Holy Spirit today in order to build a new society in the midst of the old. John Piper said it well. He says, God is calling people to move from the alienated bloodlines of race and ethnicity into the bloodline of Jesus Christ. That's what the church should be. People from all walks of life coming and being set free in Jesus Christ and understanding the unsearchable riches that the world doesn't understand and is lost and needs to hear. They don't need to hear about politics and, 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 and economics and taxes and immigration. Those are fine things. But he needs to be told of the unwretchable mis. Uh, unsearchable riches of Christ. That's it. And the church has sent through that in history. I've been going through that with the kids in school, my middle schoolers, and teaching them about how many people tried to pull down the theology and greatness of Jesus Christ. Tried to be and make him just to be a, a created man or a phantom. And not the true God who came to live with us and die for us and pay the price for us. That the church is central to our living. And how we are to live. And how we are to walk. And you see in America we have this viewpoint. That church is optional. <laughs> well I'm a Christian but I don't go to church. Wait a minute. If I were to go and say to you, I got married, but I haven't seen my wife in 30 years. How's that work for me? Oh, boy. That wouldn't work, would it? How would it be if 
I were married and I said, well, yeah, we gave our vows, but then I moved to San Diego and she stays here in Wichita. How's that work for you? Do you know your wife? Do you know what she wants? Are you really loving her? No, no, no. It's like that old joke, you know, the guy who was pregnant about 50 years of marriage and they said, well, what are you going to do? He said, well, on 25th, I took her to Italy. What are you going to do on the 50th? Go back and get her. <laughs> Folks, that, that doesn't work. It's the everyday being with each other, growing to love each other. That's what God wants. He wants us to be a part of that. And that's what the church is. And then the purpose of the mystery, and oh, folks, it's going to blow your socks off. It blew my socks off. Because look what he says here. So that the manifold wisdom of God might be made now, be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance to the eternal purpose for which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. When I read that and I started studying this, I'm like, are you kidding me? You see, the angels are created beings. And they're around us, heaven. And yet, they did not know God's plan. And God revealed it to them. And here, they're watching. They watched when he was on the cross. They couldn't believe what... He was doing. But this was God's great plan to save mankind and to build the church. Many faceted. And these created angels are learning. <laughs> and guess who they're learning from? You, me. Look what he says here made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Those angels are watching you and you are schooling them whether you realize it or not. God is unfolding his mystery through you here today as part of his plan. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4.9. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, us, to the angels as well as men. They're watching. They are watching us. And they're seeing how God is unfolding this miraculous plan of the church in you and in me. And, and, and notice what Peter says about it. It was revealed to them, the prophets, that they may not serving themselves, but you, the church. So they were revealing during their time. And when they spoke of the things that have now been told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even the angels... Long to look into these things. They are peering. Looking at you. And how you're moving about in life. And being God's church and his witness. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that the Bible says there's much joy in the presence of angels. That one person who repents. They're doing backflips. When people come to know Christ. When they repent from their sinful ways and come back to the Lord. They're in the school of training and they're watching us. We're being part of the trainers. That's what the word is saying here today. And look what the privilege we have in this whole mystery. He says, in whom we have boldness and confidence, access through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on my behalf, for they are your glory. Paul is laying it out here, and he say, 
don't get discouraged what you see me going through. This is all part of God's plan. But go to God with the boldness and confidence that you have because he gave that to you in Christ. He tore that curtain down in the temple and now you can boldly go before him. You don't need anybody else to take you there. And he brings you before the throne. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, you get on your knees and go to him. And he has given you that beautiful access to be in his presence, to go through those struggles and be on your knees and know that he is listening. He's by your side. And that he's going to care for you. And it's easy to get discouraged. I can tell you of discouraging moments in my life when you do write for God and you do and follow his will and yet you get dumped on. A lot of you have gone through that. How about when you're in college and you're being celibate because you know God wants you to save that for marriage. And then you have someone who wants that out of you and they don't get it. And so they spread a rumor that you're gay. Do you ever have that happen to you in school? Yeah. But guess what? He knew. And so did I. When we went through our thing in New Jersey, and we wondered if we really followed God's will or if we were just out of our minds. And yet today we know that that was God's will and how he grew us through those difficult times to trust him even more. Or when we decided we felt that God was calling us to start a church in Wichita and my mother-in-law thought I had lost my mind. And yet, my parents were going to see their grandchildren leave and go thousands of miles away. And then when we got here and we worked so hard for nine months to get it to come together. And the first Sunday, we had a lot of friends came. <laughs> but that second Sunday and then those summer Sundays, when we had 15 people and five of them were our family. You begin to say to yourself, what was I thinking, Lord? Did I, did I misread you, Lord? Maybe I didn't have the right headset on. But you know what? Look at here, what God has brought together. By sticking it out. Not allowing the discouragement, but getting on our knees and realizing, Lord, we believe you have this plan and we're going to follow it through no matter what. We want to follow you and do what you want us to do. Because we know that we're not right in our own selves. That we're not pure. We need you, Jesus. You're our only hope. And folks... Not for nothing. There's some beautiful people out there who need a closer understanding of Christ. They don't understand like you do that you have complete and total access to Christ and bring him anything and he'll help you. And then he'll help forgive you even our most sinful beings. He'll forgive. Like Luther, who when he was trying to feel God's presence, and when he thought he had to climb the stairs and his knees were bloody, seeking forgiveness until he read the scriptures and found out that he has total access for the forgiveness of his sins and it's by faith through grace that you're saved. And folks, you have that. You know that your Christ has forgiven you and that he 
has an open door for you. And that he's giving you this faith to trust him for eternity. And that you don't have to lose heart. Because he's got the plan. And he'll bring it about. And someday you'll see the answer to that. Let's pray together. Lord, I give you praise for being such an awesome God. Lord, we thank you for being the one who opened the door for us. And has given us the church. So that we can share and be encouraged with one another. God, I just pray that you bless us. And give us what we need. As we move forward, that you have the plan. And that we follow it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand with me and let us sing our closing hymn. And we invite you all to stay for dinner and enjoy the fellowship. And we're going to have a little, just a small meeting to let you know what's going on. Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the Father, the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Thank you.